Hello everyone, thank you for joining us again today for this session. Uh, we're just waiting for Nandan to join us. Uh, just give him a few seconds so that he can, uh, he can join us with full concentration. Hey, hello, Nandan. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, I can hear you well. Perfect, perfect. Uh, just a second, let me just switch off. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope it wasn't much trouble uh, trying to find the login for Hopin. No, <laughs> not most of our first time, we're uh, mostly used to Zoom by now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Used to Zoom and, uh, you know, the other conferencing yeah, facility. Uh, the whole school uh, tools so far. Absolutely. This, this is a new tool and this has been so far really been uh, really good in terms of engaging with all the visitors. Right. So uh, we're looking to make the most out of it uh, right now. So I think we have around 15 of 15 and growing uh, visitors. So uh, let me just give a quick brief about you. And uh, then I'll just leave the dice to you and you can just uh, start with the presentation. Sure. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, I also want to thank everyone for joining us. I know it's been a long session the whole day. You know, there's been lots of interesting topics shared and uh, lots of interesting people that have joined us with SAS Insider. So we have uh, another similar personality here. and. Uh, on enterprise tech investing including sectors such as SaaS, supply chain, supply chain and logistics which is our main uh, reason for bringing him here. Prior to joining Axel and Andan was with the investment banking team at Mosaic Capital and Indian European based investment banking firm where he advised many mid market clients on mergers and acquisitions and fundraised uh, across technology industry and healthcare sector. He has also advised several leading on, uh, enterprise tech companies on mergers and acquisitions and fundraisers. Uh, prior to this, he was with the corporate uh, and investment banking uh, team at JP Morgan. He holds an advanced diploma in finance from the University of Cambridge and has a business management degree from Bangalore University. He also holds investment certifications from the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments from London. Today, he's going to help us uh, talk about one of the basic and most crucial element in, uh, in terms of reaching out for capital investment or funding with VC firms and uh, others with a winning pitch deck. So uh, it's, it's very crucial and uh, uh, he's going to help us uh, understand the basics of do's and don'ts when it comes to a pitch deck because uh, a pitch deck uh, is the first impression here and uh, you would definitely uh, need to know the details that he's about to share. All right, uh, over to you, Nanda. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Aranda. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at SAS Insider and uh, been seeing all the good work that you guys are doing. So, um, like Aranda mentioned, I think this is one of the most critical aspects, but also the most underrated aspects because most people look at pitches and pitch books as a task, right? Uh, so first, you need to understand why you're making a pitch book before 
you can actually get into the entire process of making a pitch book. So I'd like to keep this session as um, interactive as possible. Uh, lots of questions. I'd be happy to answer a lot of questions because I think that's the only way we can solve this entire thing of how what's a perfect pitch book, right? So I'm not going to put up any presentations. I don't have any presentations. Um, I'm just going to talk about the basics of why you need to create a pitch book. Uh, and you know, sort of get the notion right that a pitch book is not just a process in the entire step. It is, it is probably the most fundamental thing that you need to do for every stage of growth. Uh, we can talk about the do's and don'ts. Uh, probably more don'ts than do's because there's no magic bullet as to what the perfect pitch book is. Right? Um, that we'll talk about what a structure of a pitch book should be like. But like I said, at every section and every intersection, I just want to have as many audience questions as possible. Right. So let's uh, let's let's dive in straight away. What what is a pitch book and why you need to create a pitch book? So till we answer this question, um, you know, people don't understand why they create a pitch book. Yes, it is a part of an investment process, but people treat it as a task, which becomes very cumbersome. You end up making a lot of mistakes when it comes to a pitch book, right? Digressing slightly away from investments, you it is very important to have a pitch book for every aspect of the business. You need to have a pitch book for your investors. You need to have a pitch book for your sales and product guys. You also need to have pitch books for hiring, right? Uh, what if you are an early stage company and want to attract employees who probably are not convinced about your firm? You need to have pitch books for those as well. So keeping all those in mind, you need to have pitches, dedicated pitch books, keep them as short and concise as possible. And once you understand the reason as to why you're doing a pitch book, the entire process becomes much simpler because you put your you put yourself in the shoes of the audience, um, whoever's reading the specific pitch book, uh, and that that makes it uh, significantly easier. Now, a pitch book is not a magic bullet. Um, let me put it this way that, you know, having a good pitch book is not going to guarantee a, a good outcome, but having a bad pitch book is definitely going to eliminate you from the process, be it sales, investors, employees, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of people treat Word documents as pitch books, uh, but mind you, those are not pitch books. A pitch book is something that's that's uh, professionally designed designed as, as aesthetically as possible, right? So keeping in, keeping in mind that, uh, it's important to have a pitch book, but at the same time, a good pitch book is not going to get you through. It's not a magic bullet. Uh, it's important to remember that, but a bad pitch book can eliminate you from the entire uh, process, uh, so to speak, right? So have different pitch books um, and, and you know, try to customize your pitch books based on your audience. And that's that's a fundamental reason as to why uh, anyone creates uh, creates a pitch book. In anything, it's the single most important document. Uh, the reason I'm going to explain that is, you know, like I said, a pitch book doesn't guarantee a great outcome, but what it does guarantee is that you move on to the next stage of the conversation, be it in a hiring conversation, be it in a sales or an investment conversation, you move on to the next stage of the conversation. So like I said, you know, you give a pitch book up front, you're not going to uh, get a guaranteed result, but it takes you to the next step, which means that you're one step closer to your final target uh, on, on what you want to achieve. And, and so on, right? Um, even if you drop out in stage two or three of the process, you built out a network, you built out a network of people you've met, you know what the process is like, you can replicate the entire process uh, going forward. Right? So treat a pitch book as something that you want for your next level of the conversation. So for example, if you have an intro pitch book to get to the second stage of the conversation, a second stage of the conversation is more likely to be a deep dive on the product or the roadmap in terms of your entire business. So design a second pitch book. There's, there's nothing wrong in doing that. Or design short pitch books, maybe five to seven slides for each stage of the conversation. And I think that simplifies a lot of things for both the receiver as well as for you. And as a founder, it also helps you in figuring out where your actual business proposition is. Because in a lot of time, you know, you look at um, the broader macro overview of the business and what you'll want to do from a vision perspective, but you forget the minor stuff. You forget the stuff that's actually working well, right? It could be in terms of the sales process. It could be product features and your product roadmap. It all gets lost in translation. So it's good to have pitch books for individual stages of the conversation. Right. So having kept that as an introduction as to why you need to do a, a pitch book and why a pitch book is not a task, uh, rather it's the entire identity of your business. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to pause here and take some questions before I dive into uh, what really a, a good pitch book should look like. Yes, uh, if anyone has any questions, please start posting them now under the sessions module or the sessions tab so that we can have London address it. But 
So I think everyone's pretty yeah. clear on why a pitch book should be made. So I think we can move on to, uh, you know, what a pitch book structure should be like and what all it needs to do, right? The most important thing that a pitch book is doing is you're telling a story, right? Uh, so there's no point in having pitch books with individual slides and headlines saying, this is the product, this is the team, et cetera. Try to create a storyboarding or a storyline that works. You start off with the opportunity and then you say, here is what the opportunity is. You put it on the head, head, headline over there. Each slide has to relate to the other, eventually crafting an entire story because your initial sales, your initial, initial investor conversations, et cetera, all of them are matters of telling the right story. Because in initial stages, you're not gonna have enough data to uh, look at customer cohorts and things like that, but you will have a story as to why you're creating this specific product and this is the market you're going after, right? The three most important things to convey are you know, from a story perspective, why is this the right opportunity? Why is this the right time? And why is this the right team to back, right? Um, you try to answer those three specific things. You leave it from an investor standpoint or from a sales standpoint. Once these three questions are answered, majority of, you know, the doubts in the reader's mind are answered completely, right? Why is this the right opportunity? Why should they spend time on a specific meeting, right? Why is this the right time to spend uh, time on that specific meeting? And why is this the right team that I need to meet? Um, mind you, it might all, all not end in good outcomes all the time, but I, I, like I said earlier, you build out good networks and those networks are only going to help you out in the future. No one's going to refuse any kind of help or deny any kind of help. So it's about going to the next stage of the conversation and figuring out what you can do from uh, there on, right? And each pitch book that you make, each iteration of the pitch book that you make is um, essentially one way of learning more about your business and once you learn more about your business the subsequent versions of pitches that you make uh, are going to be significantly easier now one of the most important things that people miss out is that once you create a pitch book you know it also helps you out with your verbal pitch which is far more important than having uh, you know a physical pitch book in place right your verbal pitch is all about your business it's all about you conveying your story to the other party be it on the sales side or the investor side or, the, or on the hiring side right uh, it helps you create that storyboarding and you don't get lost in conversations when you uh, create the right pitch book and you have to follow that when it comes to a verbal pitch um, altogether right um top three or four mistakes i think i'm just moving slightly uh, quicker because i want to spend more time on what the actual uh, format of a pitch book should be like top three or four mistakes i think one thing i'd like to highlight is there are do's and there are don'ts but it's easier to highlight the don'ts rather than the do's because the do's there are no specific magic bullets that will make it a perfect pitch book but there are specific don'ts that will eliminate you from the competition because it's it's uh, it's it's you know a, a very subpar pitch book that that you've put together right um, so having said that, some of them are very basic, you know, you look back at these and you'll be like, you know, did I actually make those kind of mistakes? One is having a single pitch book for all kinds of occasions, be it for the same investor. So for example, if you're pitching to a seed stage investor versus a VC investor or a growth stage investor, your pitch book has to be different because the ideas that you'll address in each of these pitch books are um, very, uh, very, very different, right? So you can't have a one size fits all and say that this pitch book is what I'm going to use for the entire uh, uh, set of investors. You can't use an investor pitch book for a sales conversation and vice versa, right? A sales conversation is going to be very different. You're going to be talking about a customer centric problem, uh, which a VC investor might not necessarily understand. Conversely, VC investors, you'll have things like market size, et cetera, which a sales uh, representative may not understand. So customize your pitch books, have different pitch books for each occasion and never do a one size fits all. I know it's a cumbersome task, a one time exercise that you do different pitch books for each of the circumstances. Um, you're good to go because all you need to do is continue to iterate uh, rather than create anything new from time to time. It also gives now, you a bit of a genuinity, right? So if you have a custom pitch book, the, 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 again, anyone who's looking at it, they know that you have a genuine approach to this and uh, they can trust you a bit more as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think uh, more than the genuine approach, what I would say is that they'd appreciate that you've taken specific time and effort to customize the pitch book for them, right? Um, you have a client maybe in the healthcare space, you put a healthcare example of how your product can solve for that. It's very different from saying that, you know, you have an industrial client and you've solved an industrial problem for them, right? Okay. You try to customize it so that they can relate it because at the end of the day, you don't know whom you're pitching to. It can be a sales guy, but what is his background? Has he been on the shop floor? Has he come from a sales background? Similar, similar from a VC perspective, right? Is the guy a consultant? Is he an ex-entrepreneur? Is he an ex-investment banker? You know, each of these guys need a different 
um, approach that you need to look at. So do a due diligence in terms of uh, what you want to, uh, who you're pitching to, and then customize your pitch book uh, based on that. Now, the third one is, you know, a little more on the format, but a lot of mistakes that entrepreneurs make is that you have verbose pitch text, which means that slides are dense with a lot of words. Things get lost in translation. And at the end of the day, no one has time to read a lot of words on a, a PPT or, a, a, you know, a PDF document, right? So uh, try not to make it verbose. Try to simplify the language as simple as possible. Here, you're not in for an essay test or anything like that. You don't need to put large words or large sentences. Try to keep it as concise as possible. Um, uh, simplify the problem statements. You, you can have flowcharts, images, etc. But please do not have a lot of words in a single slide because it gets lost in translation. And at the end of the day, you lose track of uh, you know, what you're reading eventually. Right? That's, a, that's a very fundamental mistake. Now, fundamental mistake number four, I think it's something that we keep seeing all the time. Please do not put wrong names. You know? For example, if you're pitching to uh, Sequoia, do not put Axel's name on the pitch book and vice versa. Right? <laughs> Please do your due diligences on that, both in terms of the pitch book and even more commonly on the name of the document. Right? You rename the document for a certain investor, but you make those mistakes, you know, fundamental mistakes uh, of putting the wrong uh, uh, receiver's name. It leaves a very bad impression regardless of how good your product is or how good your pitch and, and the rest of the pitch uh, ends up being. Then you have incorrect um, uh, hyperlinks that people put in. You know, for example, most common thing is LinkedIn profiles. You end up putting the wrong hyperlinks in the document itself. Uh, so try to avoid those. And the final thing, uh, you know, in terms of the incorrect stuff is, is more on the logo side of things. You have different companies with different names. Um, just try to ensure that, you know, all your due diligence is done from those perspectives so that you don't have any typos in the documents, right? Um, lastly, recheck every possible number that's out there in the document because, um, you know, be it your market size, be it your revenue numbers, be it your fundraise, ask, uh, whatever it is, please recheck those numbers because uh, a simple example could be that, you know, you're looking to raise a 5 million round, but, you know, you're going to a seed investor who's writing a 500k check and you put in a 5 million figure over there, you know, the conversation is automatically a no starter over there, right? So uh, try to recheck all those numbers. You don't want any typos in there. You don't want typos in the margins. Uh, you don't want typos, you know, in terms of having revenue numbers, market sizes, whatever it is. Because um, if those do show up during the conversation, you're going to be spending a lot of time justifying those kind of numbers, right? Um, and and these, are, these, are, these are fundamental mistakes that a lot of people make, right? Uh, the last one, I think I would say is, you know, founders most of the time, a lot of the time make up, make the mistake of covering up uh, certain things on the pitch book. So for example, if you have just one client, you state that you have just one client. You don't need to put the clients that you've not signed up under the clients you've signed up. You know, do not cover up anything. Leave it as it is. Leave the originality as it is, right? Um, because more than anything, what happens is this leads to a lot of perception issues. It leads to perception issues at every stage of the conversation saying that, you know, you are maybe not a credible person to talk to because you've been extending things that, that uh, should not be extended. So whatever it is, do not cover up. Um, if your margins are uh, 30, 40%, leave it at 30, 40%. Don't overstate it. Don't understate it either. But happens in other businesses where, you know, margins are much thinner of say five to 10%, right? And people say 20%, right? Do not overstate anything. And, and state it as it is today. You know, whatever it becomes tomorrow is a totally different story, but state it as it is uh, today, right? Um, so I would say that these are probably the top five mistakes that we uh, we, we see from uh, founders all the time, you know, but all, once all of these are covered, we can just move on to the structure of the document itself, right? Um, along with a verbose presentation, I would say that, you know, do not have a pitch that is maybe 30, 40 slides uh, long, right? There's no time for anyone to read it. Pitch books are getting shorter and shorter these days. It started off at say 25 slides and it's gone to 20 and now 15, right? Uh, because remember that you'll be providing a lot of due diligence data at any point in time. Even if it's a sales conversation, you start off with a pitch book, but then you go into a lot of additional customer data in terms of how your integrations are going to happen and, and things like that. So um, uh, try to keep it as concise as possible, right? Um, and the final thing over here is please send all pitch books in a PDF format. The reason I say this is not everyone's going to be there on their laptop or their computer. You're going to probably read it on your iPad, your phone, uh, whatever it is, right? And the easiest thing to read over there is a PDF. Um, we see a lot of founders sending links, et cetera. But you know, if you're in a low bandwidth area, there is a possibility that the link doesn't open. 
so try to try to compress it as much as possible and just uh, share uh, PDF files wherever possible. These seem like very minor and menial things, but these are these are things that you know sometimes can go very wrong, and you probably won't even end up getting responses if if any of these things happen. Right? So you know, having covered the mistakes, having covered what to do in a specific pitch deck, I just want to move slightly uh, into into the format of a pitch deck, right? Like I said, don't have it for more than 15 slides. And even these 15 slides need to have a certain layout or a certain structure, right? Um, since I don't have a presentation here, I'm, I'm going to be speaking about this, but I'll try to speak in as much detail as I can about each of the slides that, that we can. So like I said, 13 to 15 slides, not more than that. Um, one important thing for founders to do is each time you're adding a new um, slide, right? You think about what value that specific slide is adding because a lot of for a lot of people you know quantity is equal to quality and that's not the right approach when you create a pitch deck so each time you're adding a new slide please think over as to what that value what value that specific slide is adding right um, and the other way to approach this is if i delete a certain slide what happens to my pitch right review that entire process and once you re review that entire process you will be able to let go of a lot of slides which are unwanted and hence have a more comprehensive uh, pitch pitch or pitch book uh, whenever possible, right? Um, so, you know, moving on to the format of what a typical pitch book should be, you should always start off with the introductory slide with the name of the company, with the logo of the company and have a three to four word vision about what you're solving for, right? It can be to do with market leadership, category leadership. You can say things like India's number one or um, XYZ country's number one platform for, um, you know, whichever market you're targeting, but have a three to four line vision on the introductory slide itself. You start off with the logo, you start off with the name of the company, and then you have this. And this, this is probably the cover slide of uh, every pitch book, and that's the way it needs to be. You don't need to put, uh, you know, the name of whom you're presenting it to or customizing it to. That is not required at all. But what is very important to have is a three to four word vision. You know, vision normally people associated with a longer vision of the company, maybe uh, two lines or so, but it's important to have a three to four line vision because when you go for a conversation and you say that, hey, I'm from this company and we are building India's largest, you know, a platform for, for uh, whichever use case it is, right? Uh, it has far more impact than reading out an entire line of the vision of the company, right? Now, moving on slides two and three, are probably the crux of the story that you have. Um, you start off with what the problem statement is. Um, there are three things to it. What is broken right now? Um, what are the associate, uh, associated costs or time spends because of what is broken, right? And why it needs to be rectified. Eventually try bringing down the entire problem statement to one sentence, right? It could be a new, new world problem. It could be an age old problem, but it's important to specify the problem because like I said, your reader could be from any kind of background. It doesn't have to be, he, he or she doesn't have to be from a specific background. Um, they might not be aware of the problem altogether. So it's very important to line out maybe two slides on what the problem is, right? Uh, the industry is broken. Uh, you know, there's not enough uh, solutions out there in the market. There are legacy solutions which are not targeting these specific problems. Um, it should all lead to why y'all are solving for this, right? Which brings me to slide four. It's about the solution and how y'all are solving for the problem, right? You put three to four bullet points. It doesn't have to be product related. You don't have to line up product features. It just has to be a, a simple slide on how are you solving for the problem that you described in the previous couple of slides. It can just be, you know, collection of data, using data, X, Y, Z, try to relate it back to the problem that you've detailed out in the first couple of slides and then just see how are you solving for the specific problem. That keeps the entire problem statement and concise, uh, solution concise. It gives the reader a good introduction as to why they need to read this pitch book further or why they need to talk to you as the team. Right? Now slide five and six is a little more arbitrary and more from a market perspective. You need to detail out two things. Um, like I said earlier, why is now the right time to go after this specific problem? Because timing is everything when it comes to early stage startups and say venture capital raises, right? Why is now the right time? Um, and why am I going after this industry? How large is this industry, right? Uh, and then you have the concept of market size, which, you know, frankly can be confusing for early stage founders. You have a lot of teams like TAM, SAM, SOM, a lot of jargons, right? 
But one thing I would just say, uh, ask people to focus on is how large can your business get and how you can calculate this is, let's say you have a $30 per month product, right? You take that and multiply it into the total number of users that are potentially possible to onboard on your platform, let's say in five years time or six years time. You get, you know, the answer to how large your business can be just by doing that simple math. Do not get uh, pulled into this entire thing of TAM, SAM, SOM, because there are a lot of different methodologies to um, look at uh, when you calculate each of these measures. So for a VC, what is most important is how large can your business get? And the only way to arrive at that is you take your current product pricing or your potential product pricing and multiply it into the total number of potential users you have out there in the market. It need not be for today. It can be for the next three to five years. But at the end of the day, that's the only way you'll arrive at a particular number. Because what matters to me is how large is this company going to get? The market can be several billion dollars, right? But you're only going to get a certain percentage of that several billion dollars out there in the market. So I want to know that three years down the line, five years down the line, how large is this business going to get if you stay at steady state and leave the current product alone? This does not include any potential new products. This does not include any potential pricing elasticity of it going down or going up. At steady state, if you were to capture the entire market, this is how large my business would be. That's it, uh, as simple as that, right? Um, so like I said, two slides on the opportunity. Uh, one, uh, Just one slide on why is it the right time now and how large is this industry and what the market size is. The next slide, I would probably do a bit of a landscaping analysis. I don't like to call it competitor analysis because you know there are different ways of interpreting competitors out there in the market. So you do a landscaping analysis, saying that these are the legacy players out here in the market. These are the new age startups that have come into the picture. Ideally in a matrix style or whatever style is possible, you, you detail out the entire landscape and then you have a white space where you put your logo, saying that this is where I am and this is where I'm going to disrupt the market. Um, because it automatically speaks that you know you potentially have very low competition or this is a white space that you're getting into uh, and hence why this, this is a good opportunity to back the company as a result right you're also not being too um, uh, for lack of for lack of a better word uh, cocky and saying that uh, you know you don't have any competition because that's never going to be the truth you're always going to have competition out there in the market be it by the legacy players or startups out there so um, it's best to detail out a landscape analysis and um, have a white space where your company is situated because that talks for itself. You don't need to really explain on why the, why the competition uh, is there or not there, right? So that talks overall about the landscape, the problem, the solution, and then we move into a single slide on what your product is and what are the use cases for the product. You ideally put three or four screenshots out there. You put a few bullet points on, these are the top four or five features out, out here in the product. Right. And then you put here are the use cases. I have use cases under healthcare. I have use cases under FMCG manufacturing, whatever it is, whichever industries you have, you put, put the top three or four industries and you put use cases under each of these industries. A very concise slide, a very, uh, it's a single slide. It doesn't have to be more than a single slide to explain the product. Uh, the subsequent slide in my, in my case, it would probably be slide seven or eight would be a detailing of the business model. How are you going to make revenue of this? So you ideally have three to four sources of revenue. You can see that this first source is already live. The second source is in the pipeline. Third source is maybe two years down the line. Fourth source is maybe five years down the line. But you have a slider on that. Uh, you have you have a, a slide with you know a potential slider graph which says that these are my four potential revenue models. This is what I've started. This is what I'm going to go after, and this is what I'm going to go after. Maybe in three to five years' time. That talks about the business model uh, from from an overall business perspective. The next couple of slides, um, very important from a business perspective, detail out the traction, right? The traction, both in terms of customer signups, it can be in terms of revenue numbers you have, and more importantly, talk about the inflection point. So say, for example, I launched in April, but my inflection point only hit in maybe June or July, where I did something different with the product. Right? You put that out, you detail it out saying that here's my traction, this is how I've grown, right? Um, and have a storyboarding to that as well. We started off here, we're here today, and this is what we've achieved in the last XYZ months. And this is the reason why we've grown, and this is why customers like our product. As simple as that. Add customer logos. It's very important, very, very impactful. Have two sections. One is 
customer logos of people you've signed up already. Second is customer logos of potential people who are already there in the pipeline. Maybe in advanced conversations, but it's very important to have these logos because it's very catchy. Now, if I spend maybe five seconds on this slide, all I'm going to see are the customer logos. I'm not going to see anything else. So it's very important to have that. Um, wherever applicable, if you have data on churn and customer stickiness, please try to add it in this slide itself because it shows um, a certain usability towards your product that people are not churning off, people are sticking to this product. Even smaller factors like, you know, if someone is spending maybe one hour a day on your product and that moves up to one and a half to two hours, that's a very, very important metric to have. Uh, not a lot of people realize that, but the more time I spend on your product, the more sticky I'm going to become as a customer. So try to show those minor things uh, out there in the product, which, which talk about customer stickiness wherever possible. Now, the two subsequent slides are again very important, but may not apply to all startups, especially if you're at a pre-revenue stage or uh, at a at, at a pre-launch stage, right? Um, I always advise startups to add a slide or two on case studies for their current customers, right? Because a case study is one way of showing that these are the use cases of the product and this is the impact I've had for a specific customer. Right? You add one slide or two slides, depending on the number of case studies you have, who was the client, what was the problem and what was the impact that you had from your product perspective, you know, how did you solve for the entire problem out there? Uh, very important to have this, but like I said, not all startups are going to have uh, this kind of data because it might be at an early stage, might not have customer centricity. Uh, but um, having said that, try to quantify this as much as possible, specifically to do with the impact that you have on a customer. Uh, if you're an HR tech startup and you're solving for payroll leakages, et cetera, put the percentage over there saying that I saved this percentage of payroll for this company. Uh, try to quantify that and have the impact slide as much as possible. So, like I said, not not more than two slides on this specifically. Uh, moving on to potentially slide 12 or 30, uh, important to have what your GTM strategy and what your customer acquisition strategy is, right? Um, one is to have what y'all are doing today, because it could be that y'all are doing something efficient. Uh, and you, you, can, you can put a, a specific line item there saying that, you know, we're efficiently doing this. Our CAC is very low. Uh, and be able to, our, our GTM is very streamlined in a way that we're not going to spend on customer acquisition uh, too much going forward, right? So detail out what your customer acquisition uh, is going to be and what your GTM is going to be. In GTM, um, I would always advise startups to put in partnerships over there. It might not necessarily be a roadmap for y'all, but it does show very deep product thinking that, product and, and GTM thinking that most founders uh, have, right? You say that, you know, I'm looking at potential partnerships with these companies to enter a new geography. And partnerships are very important because they're a very cost efficient way of entering new markets. So for example, if you're in India and you want to target, see the North America market. One way is of course, to go and have the founder sitting there and uh, doing some sales and FaceTime with customers over there. The other is to have uh, potential partners who can be large corporates, can be larger startups who are going to sell your product on your behalf in those specific markets. Right? Um, it may not really materialize at all times, but it does show that you have thought down that route. You have thought down that, uh, you know, uh, cost efficient and, and uh, uh, getting to the different markets from, in a very cost efficient manner as well. So that would be slide 30. The last couple of slides, um, in my view, they have a very significant impact, but people typically tend to underestimate them is have a slide on the team. Right, a very important slide on the team. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very delicate slide as well because I see startups making mistakes by putting their entire team over there. You know, you can have a 10 member team, but you don't need to put pictures and biographies of all 10 people over there. You just need to have pictures and biographies of the founders. And again, try to keep it um, as uh, light as possible. Just put a photo, a couple of lines on the founders. Their previous work experience, et cetera, should be in the form of logos and not text as much as possible. Just put logos. Now, I'm sure there's a follow-up question saying that, what if I have an A-grade team where a lot of the other team members are from blue chip organizations? What I would say is put the team size and put the logos of all these organizations that people have worked in. You don't need to put individual profiles out there. The profiles only have to be of the co-founders, the CEO, CTO, CEO, uh, that's about it. You don't need to put head of sales or anything of, on those lines. The rest of it comes as a footer with all the logos of companies in which they've uh, worked on. Right? Uh, that's, it, it's very important to have this slide because uh, a lot of people underestimate it. 
and a lot of people write stories you know i've i've seen phantom and <laughs> abstract stories being written saying you know these guys got the inspiration from this these guys got the, uh, the inspiration from that none of that none of that makes a difference you all all that matters is what you've done in the past and you can probably put in catchy lines saying i grew the business by 10x i grew the business by 15x since i joined those are very impactful things to have so put in all of that um, don't don't do a lot of storytelling as far as this slide goes at least yeah. right yeah coming to the final slide coming yeah yeah uh, anand you had a question no no i think i was just saying like we are a creative bunch so whenever someone asks for a presentation we end up going to stories by default I think uh, this yeah. is something that uh, yeah. founders have to realize that they have to be very concise and uh, on to point as possible yeah yeah um stories are good to have except in these two slides which is <laughs> team and maybe to do with customers yeah. uh you don't need to talk about how you landed that customer or how that customer meeting went and stuff like exactly that. all it matters is what the results exactly. are right coming to the final slide which uh, you know i believe is is again very important is what is why have you sent a pitch deck right so from from an investor perspective you need to put a a, a reason on you know what your fundraise ask is right um on how you're planning to spend it those are very uh, two very important things you need to be very careful on how you design the slide uh, and also how you present the slide like i said you know if it's a, if it's a seed stage investor put in a lower amount it's always good to go from low to high but have the investment amounts right one is having the investment amount the second is to show how you're going to use it right you need to be able to state what your runway is going to be with that and what you're going to get to with that so say for example if your runway is going to be 18 months with whatever money you're raising you need to be able to tell them what your revenue and run rate is going to be at the end of the 18th month right so it's very important to put those kind of metrics in place because most founders just put the uh, put the raise ask uh, the raise ask amount and they just leave it as it is but use this slide to explain a bit more of a, in a concise manner as to why you're raising you know uh i'm going to be targeting maybe these three geographies maybe i'm going to launch a new product put two three bullet points on why you're raising how long will the raise last and what what would it take you to right um and my suggestion would be end it with this do not put any annexures on market data etc because this is for a first conversation all that matters is with this pitch deck you need to be able to get to the next conversation whatever happens in the next conversation you take you can take it forward from there right but end the first conversation with this specific pitch deck have it not more than 15 slides follow the specific format um send it across to whoever it needs to be sent across to because there are a lot of other factors so for example as an investor if i'm not interested in a company i might forward it to another investor right and the company as such may not be in, interested in connecting with that investor because they might have a portfolio conflict right so with this specific format you're not divulging too much or too many details as well you're trying to keep it as concise as possible and also being safe from a data perspective um so that in my view would be the ideal pitch deck uh, or or how i would like to see an ideal pitch deck as well um i'm pausing now for questions um i'd be happy to to, to take any questions or and if you had any questions perfect uh, no, no, i just had one question so that too with the last slide that you just wanted to add right so uh, we are going to mention the amount that we are going to ask so how do you determine the amount that you're uh, that you're going to request for and uh, when you promise a revenue in return like how do you come to that conclusion should be should that number be uh, data driven and only be accurate or uh, can we just pitch it higher or lower a bit just to place it got it so uh, my only answer to that ananda would be that you know don't don't give any kind of fairy tale numbers right it, it should be very believable it should be very achievable that's that's the most important thing um as far as how much you should raise i would say that you know you should always raise an amount that you're comfortable with from a dilution perspective and also something that covers your runway at least for the next 24 months let's put it this way let's say you don't have any revenue coming in for the next 24 months you should be able to survive right you need to have that that kind of capital in place having said that you know you need to take care of your burn rates as well you can't be that it, it can't be that you know you have a specific burn rate today but as soon as the fund days happen you're going to do 10x of that burn rate right it's um it's 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 a it's a very different thing that needs to be followed try to try to map out how much you can do with a specific amount of uh, fund days right uh, so for that you need to have your um, you know business mises in place saying that this is what my sales cost is going to be and with this sales cost if i have if i hire one resource this one resource can potentially get me 10 customers a month uh do the entire funnel uh you know in terms of how many demos i can get how many demos can one sales guy do or 
uh, try to map out that entire thing because VCs and investors love those kind of conversations when you're being honest with uh, regard to numbers and data, right? Try to map out all of that uh, and try to get to the next stage. One final thing I missed out over here, and and uh, Ananda, you you brought out a very good point, is that VCs want to see whether once they invest today, you have an exit revenue that will support your next fundraise. So, so for example, if you're raising a five million round today, right, your next round is going to be say a fifteen million round. Will your revenues reach a stage that you can support a fifteen million round, right? So you need to be able to tell that story as well, because if you're not going to get to that 15 million kind of uh, uh, growth, you know, in, in terms of your next fund is you don't have the revenue uh, run rate for that. It's going to be a big red flag for the VC. So that is one important thing that founders typically tend to miss out. And it happens at every stage. You know, if you're doing a 500K round, your next round is probably going to be a three or four million round. So can you use that 500K to, to get to the next stage of growth? So try to map out that it's important to have a financial model in place specifically for this, but know your business numbers in, in and out so that you know, you're know you not extending anything from a fundraise perspective, nor extending anything from a, a, a ARR perspective. Perfect, perfect. And with that, we also have a couple of questions. The first one was uh, is from Rahul Arun. And uh, he was asking us, uh, how about a flyer before the pitch book? Is that something that uh, people do right now? Uh, it's a very interesting question, uh, Rahul. So I think we see uh, that happening in, uh, a lot in late stages. Um, and it's a very investment banker concept where you know you send a teaser beforehand and then you have the pitch book, et cetera. I'm not sure it's very appreciated in VC though, because VCs you know, like it upfront. You send the entire pitch book. If you don't want to send specific things around traction, et cetera, it's fair to delete those slides, but um, try to avoid these flyers, which are like one or two slides uh, long, especially if you're an early stage startup, it doesn't matter because uh, at the end of the day, you need to talk to maybe uh, 20, 30 VCs to get some meaningful conversations going forward. Um, so I would I would avoid flyers, but if you want to have a slightly shorter version of the pitch book where you don't disclose customer details, et cetera, it's fair to have that, no problem. Perfect, perfect. And we have another question from uh, Bimlesh from PitchCamp. And uh, he was asking you, uh, would you suggest different pitch books that need to be shared versus that you present in person or should that remain the same? Good. Uh, that's, that's another interesting question because you know, a lot of times what happens is you send a pitch book ahead in advance and um, you don't you don't necessarily, it, it again depends on the VC. They want a presentation, they don't want a presentation. Some of them like uh, a straight conversation um, out there, right? Any specific data requests are there, we'll reserve it for after the meeting, maybe for the next round of conversations, just to be mindful of the founder's time as well. Um, so ideally, uh, no Bimlish. I don't, I don't, at least in my view, you don't need to have two different pitch books. You send one ahead in advance and uh, you don't need to present anything as such during the meeting. But um, if you if you do want to go down that approach, um, you can use the second pitch book as slightly more detailed in terms of your customer cohorts and a lot of data that you don't want to send in the form of deck, right? So that the access is not with them, the access is with you. You show it during the meeting and that's about it. Right? You keep something handy, especially if you have a lot of customers and revenue, people do, people would like to see cohorts, um, people would like to see churn data, etc. It's good to have all that in, in the form of a, a pitch deck. They can show something, but um, at the same time, you can uh, immediately withdraw it once the presentation is over. You don't necessarily need to have it. But um, it's it's quite rare that I've seen that you have two different pitch books, one to send across and then one to present during the meeting. Because frankly, if you ask me, I'd prefer a face-to-face -face or, or a direct one-on-one -on -one meeting without any presentations uh, out there. Okay. And uh, the last question is from Danabala. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking he's trying to ask us, like, what has changed with all these pitch slides pre, like pre-COVID, during uh, the pandemic and post-COVID? And has the positioning uh, changed in any way? Um, and, you know, I think that's a, it's a, it's a very subjective thing, uh, but we've seen a lot of pitch decks having a separate slide on COVID impact. I think that's one thing that's changed, um, especially in, in businesses which have been positively impacted by COVID. Uh, people have tended to put, uh, seeing that COVID has accelerated a lot of their uh, business uh, opportunities out there. The second thing we've seen is if, if businesses have remained flat and not had too much of degrowth during COVID, um, they put a slide highlighting saying that, you know, COVID has not impacted our business at all, which is which has been a very good uh, thing for the business. So I think that's the only change I've seen as such, not too, much, too many changes, um, at least with regard to VCs and early stage companies. Uh, 
maybe the only change is adding a couple of slides on COVID impact, if at all, right? Uh, or maybe if you're a bit more of an optimist, you add a separate slide on, you know, how COVID could accelerate our business, right? How COVID has given rise to new opportunities that we can look at. I've seen this particularly in portfolio companies, which, you know, probably in the space of HR tech, et cetera, where work from home has given rise to new business opportunities for them, right? Um, so they've put in slides saying that, you know, COVID has positively impacted our business and uh, we're looking at accelerating our fundraise because our business has been positively impacted. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that makes, all of this makes perfect sense. And uh, with that, I don't think we have any more questions and uh, I think we don't have much time as well. Uh, we've utilized most of the time that you promised for us and you've been a wonderful host. You've given us uh, lots of good information about uh, the pitch decks, what to do, what not to do, and uh, the things that you have to have a keen eye for. Uh, in a way, it, it sounds like a resume, but the resume for your future and everyone in your company's future. Right? It, it's a, yeah. a large scale uh, deal here, and uh, I'm pretty sure people have to have this uh, on point when they are going to present it in front of VCs. And I'm pretty sure the the presentation that you gave would definitely help a few that has been watching you. Hopefully we get to uh, hear it from them and uh, people free, uh, please be feel free to connect with uh, Nandan on LinkedIn and uh, uh, do drop, uh, drop a text to him. And uh, if you're interested, uh, do stay and uh, listen to other sessions. Uh, we have lots of interesting sessions lined for you. And Nandan, thanks again. Thank you for your valuable time. It has been a really great and informative session. And, uh, we'll, uh, yeah. we'll be looking forward to connect with you further on other sessions as well. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ananda. Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, all the best. Great. You have a good day. Thank you.